So Isaac Newton once said, no great discovery was ever made without a bold guess. So this has, holds to be true for all the great discoveries that mankind has ever made in history. Fire is one of our first technology that humans have ever made. And it seems a long time ago since that was discovered. But what have we done with it? In the ninth century, gunpowder was discovered. And that set the preface for modern day rocketry for our, our space rockets. 17th century, uh, smallpox was eradicated. And this was the first time a, a disease has been eradicated by human intervention. 20th century, satellites, spacecraft, internet, that led to 1961, the first, um, first launch into space. In 1969, this was this uh, allowed for man on the moon. In the 21st century, nanotech, biotech, were just the for amongst the first discovery in the first decade. We're now in the year 2019, and right now we're on the verge of being allowing us to allow um, gene editing, to allow our bodies to be enhanced, to eradicate diseases. And for the first time in human history, medical and space technology are converging together to allow, allow us to make plans and to uh, realize visions to allow us to go and colonize and explore other planets. So for all those people here tonight that knows me, you know my ambition is, very, is unlimited. And for those who do not know me, please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Joshua Chow, and if you'll indulge me, I would like to show you how I plan to change the world. So good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming today to my talk on tonight on curing diseases in space. I realized a couple of nights ago that the title might, can be interpreted as curing diseases that are in space. So if you're here for that talk, it's probably not the right one. So I'm actually here talking about curing diseases on Earth through space. Now before, I, before we embark on this journey tonight into space, there's one word I'd like everyone to forget tonight. And that word is the word impossible. The world is round. That was thought to be impossible. We want to fly in the skies, impossible. We want to reach for the stars, impossible. How many times in human history have the impossible been shown to be possible? And that is one word that we try to forget, especially when we're doing research in places like Harvard. The impossible becomes the possible. Like many of you tonight, you're here coming to this lecture because you're curious about space. The curiosity of space, the wonders of space, the impact of space, and more importantly, the mysteries of space. And like you, I'm also a sci-fi person, and I love space as well. So it all started with E.T. trying to phone home. And I was actually thinking the other night, you know, it's actually really bad luck for E.T. to have landed during that time, because if he landed now, then he wouldn't have a problem phoning home. Like, he would just go up to anyone, grab a phone, and he'll be able to dial home. But what I'm trying to say is that Sci-fi has always been embedded in our society, whether it be in culture or in film. And oftentimes, a lot of things start with sci-fi, but then it's soon after it becomes reality. So for example, Armageddon, you know, talking about, oops. Oh, wow. Sorry, I just got this new one, so I'm trying to get used to it. Armageddon, talking about the impact you know, of asteroids. And we constantly hear news about asteroids that might be hitting Earth. Life in another planet, are we alone in the universe? These are real questions that we've always been wanting to answer. The Martian, you know, that has been hailed as one of the, the movies that most depict um, the uh, realistic um, space exploration. It's so real, when I was in Boston, I had to argue with my Uber driver that it's, it wasn't a documentary, it, that was, it was just a movie. <laughs> um, he actually thought it was a documentary. I was like, no, bro, you have to look that up. It's really not. Um, but it was so real, it felt like a documentary. And of course, um, coming, uh, I think in the summer, Ad Astra, um, Brad Pitt is in it. And that has, they have proclaimed that it is the most realistic depiction of space travel. So you can see that the fabric of space and the um, mysteries of space has always kept humanity really interested in it. Just last month, the front cover of Time magazine, the next space race, so we've already known about the first space race, and that was going into space, going to the moon. What is the next space race? The next space race is really about colonizing, 
landing on the moon, colonizing the moon, going to Mars, colonizing Mars, and beyond. You can also see that no longer space travel is limited to just countries like the United States or China, but there is, we have started to see the privatization of space. So space exploration is just literally on the horizon. NASA and everyone else also have their own programs and, and um, programs to go to Mars. And how are we gonna build the science, the exploration, the technology to send people to Mars and live on Mars? So it actually all started with Isaac Newton coming out with the universal theory of gravity um, in, in the 1600s. Little did he know that 300 years later that there will be astronauts floating on the International Space Station. Just like me, when I first started studying, little did I know that here tonight, I'll be talking to you all about surviving and curing diseases in space. So the first man in space was a Russian cosmonaut called Yuri, and since then, 560 people have gone into space. But what we don't realize is that these astronauts or cosmonauts, or the space travelers, they've been carefully selected based on certain criteria. Uh, whether it be physical, mental, and so on. But that is no longer the case anymore. With the privatization of space, th these criteria are no longer limited to certain space agencies from each country, but rather up to individual medical officers. So one of the most famous pictures that we, everyone relates to in space is the floating astronaut. Things float in space. And why is that? And that is due to a condition called microgravity. So up these are either people or objects that appears to be weightless. And the effects of microgravity can be seen um, in astronauts floating in space. And so we all see in a lot of um, pictures. So what is microgravity? So when we drop something here on Earth, you know, it falls to the ground. And that is um, due to the effects of gravity, which is 1G. When an astronaut drops the same object in space, it is also falling, but it's just that because everything is falling, it seems like it's weightless, and we call that zero gravity or microgravity. So for those of you who plays a bit of game, you'll know that Angry Birds, you know, you shoot the bird. <laughs> Angry Bird, when you shoot the bird, um, it's, also, it's also due to the effects of gravity. Um, so everything in our solar system, whether it be the planets, us on the planet, um, is also subjected to the laws of physics and gravity. So throughout human history, things have changed. The environment has changed. Human evolution has happened. Genetic um, knowledge has changed as well. But the one thing that has remained constant is gravity. That has not changed. The world around us has changed. Physical, chemical properties have changed, but gravity has never changed. And that is a very powerful thing because it means that in our genetic code, there is absolutely no memory of the adaptation other to the gravity on Earth. So this is very interesting and it presents a lot of opportunities for scientists like myself um, to conduct research in biomedical research, commercialization, or even just fundamental science and also for space exploration. So let's start with the beginning of the journey for astronauts. They go up on the spaceship. So this presents a lot of medical challenges in space flight. So you can see anyone sitting on the chair going up into space, they'll be subjected to different forces in the X, Y, Z direction. So whether it be a push, sideways, or up and down. So we live in a three-dimensional world where there's X, Y, and Z, and these forces are present um, on the on the astronauts as they go up into space. Of course, the effects of gravity or microgravity is dependent on how long the astronauts are actually exposed to, to the microgravity environment. That simply implies how long they're actually in space for. So this year, uh, these three astronauts are going up to the International Space Station. And uh, Captain Haig, he made a very interesting statement. Getting there is only half the battle. We're just starting to study those on experiments here on the space station to see how microgravity changes the cell function. So he's acknowledging that get, we have the existing technology to get into space, but getting there is actually just half the battle. We actually have to survive it. 
And what they, she's saying is that they've only started to look at how microgravity uh, affects cell function. And this is exactly what I'm doing in terms of my research. And also this reflects on you know, our technology in the last decade in terms of space technology hasn't really matched our research in terms of how microgravity affects cell function. So what happens to the body when you're in space or under microgravity condition? So in the short term, uh, there are some short term effects. It, again, reinforcing that there are different, depending on the duration that you're exposed to microgravity, you have a lot of different medical challenges and effects as well. So whether it be hours, weeks, or months, they'll have detrimental um, effect on, your, on the body. But what you see over here is that the the effect is either radiation, no, okay. It's either radiation or microgravity on the right hand side. So microgravity plays an important role um, in the human ph physiology when we're in space. What is very interesting is that it takes about 48 to 72 hours for the astronaut to start to feel the effects of microgravity on, on the human body. So we all know the one thing that we correlate astronaut and space exploration is, the, is, is bone, the loss of bone in space. And that is because you know, bone is a very unique um, tissue, an organ in your body that is responsive to bone, uh, to mechanical loading. And what that means, for example, when we, we always tell our kid to go out, run around and exercise, those are mechanical loading. When we're middle-aged men like myself, you know, we're asked to you know, do more weights. You know, as we progress in life, we're asked to do a lot of sports. That's why we ask people to do sport, because of those mechanical loading help our body to build muscles, tissue, and keep maintain our um, homeostasis. And in case anyone is curious, this is a real life picture of me. Um, <laughs> I just cut out the head so that you can really see my body right underneath here. So just to clarify that. So if that holds true, that your body responds to mechanical loading for, to sustain homeostasis, then the opposite must also be true. In an unloading environment, where there is no more gravity, where there is no more force in your body, what happens to it? And that's where we start to see the loss of bone. Um, nope. So you can see that the percentage change in bone density per month during space flight is about one to one and a half percent. You lose that much bone when you spend one month in space. So that is why astronauts can't stay in space for too long. Obviously, there are certain areas in your skeletal system that are not that susceptible um, to the loss, but overall, and especially in the back, the hip, um, and the other areas, you lose a lot of these bones. So this actually causes a lot of problem because you can imagine, even if we have the technology to say we can go to Mars tomorrow, what happens when we get there and we can't function, uh, our body can't function to its full capacity? We're not able to colonize, we're not able to do work, and that causes a lot of problem. So that's why it's becoming very important to develop countermeasures to um, predict um, what type of side effects there is from uh, long duration space travel. So this is where my research comes in, um, in terms of the terrestrial musculoskeletal problems. So just like astronaut losing bone, it's also very similar to a problem here that is already prevalent on Earth, and that's osteoporosis. So you know, uh, there are also other types of bone diseases like bone cancer, but personally, my area of research is in osteoporosis. So, so to put things into context, I'd like to show you how I've worked through my career to, where, to get to where I am today. So I started my bachelor's um, at UTS in 2001. And as I mentioned before, the beginning of 21st century, it was all biotech or nanotech. So I was one of those people that did nanotech um, because that was held as the future. Then I followed through with a PhD in developing biomaterials for bone tissue regeneration. So that, what that meant was developing materials for when people break their bone, um, how can we put new materials in there to help um, improve the fracture time and, and healing time as well. Then I did my first postdoctoral fellowship at UTS. 
Then I went to Japan um, as a JSPS postdoctoral fellow in which I developed drug delivery system for bone tissue regeneration. So that's enhancing the bone materials by adding different drugs into it to see if we can increase and speed up their regeneration process. Now, at that point in time, I was not happy with it. There was only so much materials on planet Earth and there's only so much we can do about it. It was not enough to cure osteoporosis. So I wanted more. So that's where I met my supervisor at Harvard and I decided to go to Harvard. Obviously not I decided, you know, people just don't decide to go to Harvard. But I decided to pursue and in getting into Harvard and that took a year or two before I actually got there um, to study bone cell signaling. Now what that means is we're studying at the cellular level how cells communicate with each other. It's no different than us humans talking to each other. If we can't understand how we talk, then there's no communication. So it's learning a different language, but on a cellular level. So in 2017, I came back to Australia. I went back to UTS. Um, so I just have to show everyone what Harvard looks like. Um, so that's me and my baby um, over there, um, over at the Harvard Medical School. Um, and then I was also fortunate enough to be awarded the Dean Scholar um, over at Harvard as well. So just a little insight into what is osteoporosis. Like why is it so, so important and why does this affect so many people? It's considered a silent disease because you don't really know you have it until you fall down and have a fracture, you go into the hospital, hospital and the doctor tells you that you have osteoporosis. Or else there is no other symptoms that, um, sh that shows on the outside. So a lot of people don't know they have it. So what is osteoporosis? So in a healthy person, your bone remodeling, which means the, the, the building of new bone and the destruction of old bones is in balance. When you have osteoporosis, obviously you have more breaking than building. So that tips um, the balance over to the other side, and so you have more destruction of your bone. Similarly, the other can be hold true is that you can have more deposition than destruction. So you can see from the top right image, um, you can see the, the bone density of a normal healthy bone and also in the osteoporotic bone. I'm part of the American Society for Bone Mineral Research and they made a um, survey and found that more US women die each year from complication or hip fracture than from breast cancer. So you can see that bone, bone problem, fractures, osteoporosis, this is actually quite a uh, detrimental disease um, that, that hasn't gained as much attention as cancer. So back in 2001, um, a bunch of scientists found a very interesting person, uh, this guy over here on the right. He has actually a lot, of, you can see that his cranium, his forehead is actually very bulged out. He has really big jaws. I think he's also blind and deaf as well. This came from a mutation in one of the genes in the bone um, that's called osteocytes. So I'm not sure if this is it, no. Okay, oh, here we go. Osteocyte. So there's are three main bone cells in your body. The bone, uh, the bone building one up here called osteoblast, the bone destroying osteoclast, and the manager cells called the osteocyte. So you can see that this man over here, poor man over here, you know, he suffered from a condition that has an overexpression of sclerostin. So the sclerostin is a marker that is only produced by the osteocytes. So when they found that there was a mutation in the SOS gene, it means that the, he, he's suffering from a condition in which it keeps building bone, right? So that's why he's suffering from, um, you know, his jaw is um, really elevated, his cranium is out everywhere. Um, so that's what the condition where his body is constantly just making bone and that is not re being replaced by the destruction of the old bone. So knowing that, th this marker was able to continue to grow bone, what happened was the pharmaceutical company Engen, and together with NASA and Harvard, together they developed a sclerostin antibody. What this means was that it blocks the pathway of um, osteocytes creating this protein. And from there, they did this test in space. So we know astronauts lose this bone, so they want to test it in space and see what happens to osteoporotic rats model that they took up the space for two weeks. And you can see, 
you can see, so this is the region of interest. So this is the part of the femur, um, the area that they're looking at. So this is the control group. This is the osteoporotic group. And then this is the osteoporotic with the drug um, being injected. You can see from the statistical analysis that the one with the drug, the bone density matches those of the control group down here on Earth and similarly on the other side as well. So this was actually very important because for the first time in human history, we've actually used space to cure a disease that is prevalent on planet Earth. So as part of that, obviously they went through a lot of clinical trials to confirm those um, results. And as, as you can see, as of April uh, 2019, which is only four months ago, this has been FDA approved for treatment of osteoporosis in postmenopausal women with high risk fracture. Um, it was approved in Japan in um, February as well. It's been held as going to be the gold standard for osteoporotic treatment in the coming years. And it does exactly what it was supposed to do. Um, it blocks the serostin um, production in osteocytes and therefore increases bone formation and while decreasing bone resorption. So this is a very beautiful case study showing the potential of using the International Space Station to not only study diseases, but also study the human biology as well. So you can see that what they did was you, you, using the International Space Station to do this early targeting screening and also the preclinical studies and then following on with the clinical studies back on Earth, which eventually lead to commercialization. So this shows that there is potential for using the unique environment of space to really study what's happening here on Earth. So I was very fortunate to be part of that project and I was very excited by it and to be able to contribute to it. But then it left me with a lot of more questions. So you know, how does the body, how do cells actually respond to microgravity? Are there certain mechanical receptors that, you know, that cells perceive these forces? And so what are they? What, are, what is a normal threshold for gravity that cells can function or tissue can function properly? You know, how does microgravity um, change its cell response? And more importantly, how do, they, how do they participate in your tissue growth, organ growth, and regeneration? These are very fundamental questions that we have yet to have any answers of. And these could be crucial and important if we want to do things like tissue regeneration, organ growth, and so forth. Before we get into any deeper, I want to introduce to everyone the concept that your cells is more than just a cell. It is actually sensitive to the environment, just like you and me on the outside, but at a smaller scale. Just like us, we love to go to the beach and you know, do yoga, have a lot of space, and stretch out ourselves. I was one of the fortunate people to experience the peak hour traffic of Tokyo train lines, uh, where I had to be stuck in one of those um, trains. And I'm a pretty big guy by compared to Japanese standard, and I feel like I want, I'm almost going to die in there. And you can imagine they have to do that every day. Similarly, cells feel the same. If they have space to spread out, they're happy. But if they're crunched up together, they also want to die. And that means, if that is true, then that also means that they can sense their surroundings. But how do they do that? So as part of my research, I look I study um, a signaling pathway called the YAP and PAS pathway. It probably won't mean anything to you, um, but it's a very important pathway because every single tissue and organ and cells in your body is governed by this pathway. Just think of it as a center for, uh, for transducing or translating um, those mechanical signals that happens in your body. So organ growth, when you're a baby inside the mother's womb, how fast it grows, how much it grows. Have you ever wondered how, how does your body and cells tell when to stop or when to grow? These are all governed through this pathway. So that's why this pathway is very important. Now I look at it from a perspective of bone tissue um, because that's my interest and that's my area of study. So a lot of people ask me, 
how did it all start? You know, how did you get from bone into this whole space thing? Well, it wasn't one moment in my life, but rather it started with my lunchbox at Harvard. So even when you're at Harvard, even lunchboxes aren't safe. We started talking, we started to write down ideas on, this, um, on brainstorming how we can measure these mechanical signals um, in, the, in, the, in, the ce in the cells. Then when I came back to Australia, one day while I was picking up a delivery from the, from the delivery store, the delivery guy for some reason drew a spaceship going to another planet. I was like, oh, that's interesting. How does he know I have these um, interests? And finally, um, my research partner, Dr. Peter Bradbury, who's sitting back there tonight, um, was also an inspiration for me. Um, to, and we talked a lot. Um, and we were just two crazy people coming up with ideas. Uh, so put all together, we decided to follow this dream on seeing, understanding how cells perceive um, their environment. So the ultimate question came down to, how do we um, create microgravity here on Earth that cells can actually perceive and we can do experiments on it? So there are a number of strategies, and one is a neutral buoyancy. That's not really feasible. Magnetic levitation using superconducting um, superconductors. That, while it creates the microgravity, it's not feasible to put cells in there for a long time. And then the most popular, um, you know, parabolic flights or drop towers. So you have those um, comet vomits, um, also drop towers, because the microgravity that they can induce is only about three to ten seconds. So for cell study, they don't respond that fast. So it does not fit what we want to do. So the only thing left is the random position machine, or the RPM. The RPM is not a new concept. It's a not a new technology as well. So other people have attempted um, at building these type of um, devices, but you can see that they're very bulky. Um, you know, they, they're rotating the whole incubator. Um, this one is just really gigantic. I um, don't know why. The closest one we could find was the Airbus one. And this has been built for the last at least a, a decade. But no one has been able to use it because back then no one understand the concept of this, how cells perceive the environment. So it's kind of been lying there kind of dormant um, without in people really using it or applying it to um, its full potential. For those people that are old enough, like me, um, who've seen the movie Contact, um, that machine that they built, it also looks like an RPM, so I thought it was pretty cool. So I talked with one of my students who graduated because he's a brilliant engineer. I'm a cell biologist, I'm not an engineer, so I can't make these things. So I talked to my student, how can we actually build one of these that fits the profile of what I need to do in the laboratory to study cells? So uh, my student Anthony, uh, he went away. Um, for, for a few weeks, and then after a while, he came back and he made me one of these um, microgravity devices. So this is what it actually does. So you see that flask, that little flask with the blue lid? That inside there, there are cells. And you can see that it's rotating on three different axes. And, and also here, you can, down here, you can see that there's a graph you know, it accelerates at a certain rate and at a certain angle that creates the microgravity that we wanted. What was really cool about what Anthony did was that he developed the algorithm so that we can actually um, produce the gravity of from different planets. Um, so that means we can actually mimic the conditions of gravitational pull from different planets and therefore study and get a glimpse and an idea of how cells or tissues will respond under those type of conditions. So last week, me and Anthony were actually interviewed by the, um, ABC 730 reports. I think that's gonna be aired either this week or next week. Um, and he's also sitting there as well. So you guys can go take a selfie with him later. <laughs> so um, so it, it was great. So we have this great device that can mimic microgravity. It's all good. Now, I want to use it for um, my bone research, and that's great. But there was a bit, there, another question. So this was a point in time in my life where people around me started to also develop cancer. When I was a kid, 
knowing someone to have cancer was really, really, really rare. Like you probably have to go to another city to even find anyone that might have it. But now fast forward 30 something years later, it's becoming widely accepted in our society to get different variations of cancer. So you know, well, at my age, you know, people around me, people I care, I love, um, start to either develop them or have the onsets of cancer. And that was, that for me, that was not something I can live with. I'm a person of action, and there was, at, but I was also very conflicted because I could not restart a career looking into cancer research. And there are a lot of other brilliant people out there um, that do cancer research. So what can I do to help or contribute? So I thought about cancer. So we all know cancer starts off really small. Right over here. So it starts out really small, and then it multiplies, and it gets bigger and bigger, and then it becomes so big, eventually it uh, invades other surrounding tissue. That's the very basic model of how cancer works. You also have to appreciate how well cancer can conduct modern warfare. It's no different than any types of warfare in history. You start off really small, you build a small base, you get more troops in there until you're so confident that your base is well fortified, then you send troops out to invade the rest of the country. And that is how cancer um, operates. So, as I mentioned before, I study the Yap and Taz pathway, and like I said before, it's preserved in all the organs in the human body. When I was at Harvard, even though I was working on the bone stuff, every single cancer-related research group there was studying how Yap and Taz affect cancer biology. And in, in, in recent publication, they've, they've, um, they've actually said that Yap and Taz is the origin of all human cancer. So what that means is the ability for cancer to migrate in your body, that is also governed by Yap and Taz. How it adapts to the environment once it gets there, that's through the Yap and Taz pathway. How it multiplies and you know, sense its surrounding, that is also th through the Yap and Taz pathway. So you can see that the cancer cell is one that is highly sensitive to its surrounding. So last week, I had to actually go to my child's childcare center to present what I'm presenting to you tonight. And I thought the best way to describe this was through Avengers. Thanos being the bad guy, the cancer bad guy, and the superheroes are attacking him. We have in human history spent trillions of dollars, endless years, developing superhero drugs to combat cancer. And don't get me wrong, we've made a lot of progress, and they're very effective drugs, um, and they work to a certain extent, but nevertheless, cancer still stands. We have yet to find any cure. Uh, we've done quite well, but we haven't got there yet. So the biggest thing in cancer therapy right now is personalized cancer therapy. So what that means is that we finally accepted that cancer are all different. Each person's cancer is different. Each individual is different. And therefore, we cannot possibly make a drug to target different people with different types of cancer. It's just not possible. So now the big thing is about personalizing the therapy for a specific patient to a specific cancer. So it's like saying in this room, everyone is different, right? You're all different from different races, different age groups, different sizes, and so on and so forth. There's no possible way I can develop a drug that can target every single one of you because everyone's different. But I thought about it. <coughs> Even though the individuals are different, the cancers are different, there is something that they all share in common, and we all share in common. We all need to breathe, we all need to eat, we all need to sleep, and we all sense as well. So what if cancer also have these similar traits that they share amongst themselves as well? So that led me to ask the question, so what happens if I put cancer in an environment when they, they can no longer sense each other. What happens to them? If they can't sense, how do they form a tumor? Can they still form a tumor? If they have already have a tumor, will the tumor disintegrate or will it break down? These are really fundamental questions, and yet no one has ever done it before. But before I can do that, 
I also need to have a good cancer model. So a lot of drugs and so on has been developed in, in the laboratory, but they don't hold up when it gets to the, the human body. And that's because of the different types of environment. So thanks to the um, UTS Faculty of Engineering, they were able to support us um, with a bioprinter in which I'm able to create a 3D, uh, artificial 3D tumor model that mimics the um, biological environment. And this is one of the bulb printers um, printing, um, printing little spheroids and that eventually grows to look like these. So these are three dimensional cancer tumor model artificially created in the laboratory at a high throughput production allowing us to screen for drugs and study cancers and see how they work. So now I have both technology, a microgravity device and a realistic um, uh, cancer model. <coughs> so let's put cancer to the test. How do they hold up in microgravity? So I started off with a nasal cancer. You can see in normal gravity, um, normal gravity, the cancer cells are like this. After 24 hours of microgravity, there's less of them. That looked really promising. Then I looked at ovarian cancer. So again, you see a large population in the normal gravity environment and a significant reduction in the microgravity. Now happy with that, I kept going. Breast cancer. Again, you see a large variety of cells and then after 24 hours, you have reduction in the cells and they look also different as well. So this, what this tells me is that you have nasal, ovarian, breast cancer. Three different parts of your body in three different types of conditions and yet, all of them respond very similarly to microgravity um, in that they, reduce, they are reduced in numbers and also in shapes and sizes. What was also very interesting is the surviving cell, cancer cells, if I return them back to normal gravity environment, after 72 hours, they actually gain their full functions back. So isn't this really interesting? It takes an astronaut about 72 hours to adapt, to start to feel the effects of microgravity in space. And similarly, and in the opposite, it takes 72 hours for cancers to get its full function. So, I don't believe in coincidences. There must be something there as well. So from this result, we looked at, you know, is the cytoskeleton a, a possible mechanosensor? So if you think of the cytoskeleton as the structure of the cell, it's no different than the bones of our body. Um, so is this a possible um, mechanosensor? Are they sensing through their um, cytoskeleton? Maybe they are. So we, we dug a little bit deeper. So the changes in the cell number, is it because the cancer cells are actually dying or they just, you know, they can't be attached anymore and they're just floating around? Um, what's happening to their cell cycle? <coughs> so what we found was that if you remember from high school when we did all this mitosis stuff, I had to look back because I forgot about it. Um, you know how there's different phases of your cells um, um, replication. Um, so what we found was that the cells were actually stuck in this G2 phase um, where they're actually unable to grow. Um, and this is very interesting because just by using microgravity and no drugs at all, we were able to make the cancer cells not only come off, but be stuck in the state where they can not grow anymore. And this is very significant. So I want to make it clear to everyone, we don't, we're not aiming to create a miracle drug. Um, I just don't think that's possible. But what we're, what we're able to do is to provide us with an advantage with co to coexist with current therapies and to make a more effective therapy for people um, suffering from cancer. The number one question I get from people um, is so are you saying that if we, ha if, if we have cancer, if we fly up to space and say Virgin Galactic, we'll be cured of it? Um, that's not what I'm proposing here. And I've talked to a few ministers, they even proposed, well, how about we build a big simulator where we can put the cancer patient in there and we spin them around. I, I said that could be a problem because the first thing that's gonna happen is that they're gonna vomit to death first um, before anything actually you know, gets cured. Um, so that's not very feasible. 
what I am proposing is to, like the, the bone drug into tricking the body or tricking the tensor that it is in microgravity. So if they can sense the microgravity here on Earth, it means that there's some sort of sensory receptors that we can target and make it feel like it's actually out in outer space, just like virtual reality. It can be very convincing. So if we can convince cancer that it's actually floating in space, then how does it, it can no longer function, and we can target it with current therapies and have a better much effect on it. So where do we actually go from here? So everything I've told you right now has been done in the laboratory. So I, this year I embarked on um, a new project called Project JIA. Uh, this is the patch. And what we want to do is actually to conduct this experiment in actually in space. So working with Airbus, Alula, and Zertia, these are the first Australian companies that can help facilitate um, this type of mission launch. And the Airbus engineers will be coming uh, to help us integrate with their system so that we can make a launch. Also, I'm partnering with Harvard and MIT as well. Now, when I say Harvard and MIT, I'm not collaborating with some young professors that just think space is cool. These are professors, these are world-renowned researchers, professors to be at the top of their game in the cancer field. These are people who you normally don't meet, and if you do, you have about five minutes of their time um, that they actually care to listen to you. But yet, when I first told them about my project, they actually gave me their complete support. So if I can convince professors, world-leading professors from Harvard and MIT, it means I'm actually doing, hopefully I'm doing something that's actually right. So what th does this mission mean? It's going to be Australia's first research mission to the International Space Station. Now, this is actually very historical. Uh, because we, Australia has actually never launched a research mission to the ISS, and this is going to be the first one. Now, initially, I wanted it to be a mission where it's just promoting Australian innovation, Australian glory, and everything, but I think that sends a wrong message, um, so that's why I partner with um, Harvard and MIT, because I want this to send out the message that this is a mission for humanity and for all humankind. It's not just for Australians but for everyone that is on Earth. So in April, just a couple of months ago, um, a company in the US called Emulate, they also too started to send stuff into space and to study you know, brain, kidney, and lung as well um, on the ISS. And this how happens to be my supervisor from Harvard. It's one of his company. Um, so I was a little bit upset um, that he beat me to it. Um, but at the same token, there is no one else on Earth that can say that they're in, competi in competition with him because no one can be, be like him. He's just a person that thinks two steps ahead of everyone. So it actually, it's actually a good compliment. It reinforces that what we're doing is actually um, really novel and more importantly, impactful. So what are we doing as part of our project JIA? So what does it stand for? It stands for Joint International Astrobiology. Some of my friends called it Josh in Action, which sounds cool as well, so uh, either interpretation is fine. Um, but not only is this gonna be Australia's first research mission to the ISS, it's also gonna be one of the most advanced cell biology study to be conducted in space. So there is not a lot of people um, in the world that has actually conducted this type of study in space. If you want to send a satellite into space, that could be done quite easily. But what we're talking right now is sending live cells into space. It has to survive it, we have to maintain it, and we have to get it down back to Earth. So that adds a lot, a lot of dimensions of complexity, and there are no current technologies. So we actually have to build it from scratch. So luckily, I have a lot of uh, talented students that had helped me build all these new technology. And why I say it's the most advanced cell biology study is because if you look around, all the study conducted in space has been collecting samples upon returning. What we are able to do is to study the cells live while it's still in space. And that will give us much more accurate um, results and response 
um, then collecting the sample when it gets back to um, Earth. So we set a launch date um, to be somewhere in the first quarter of 2020 um, because launching a space mission is not as trivial as one um, uh, says. So what will actually happen as part of this mission? So we've done the hard part, the developing the space module. We actually have to go to the United States 24 hours before the launch. We actually load the cells into the our module. It gets launched. It goes to the ISS. It'll stay there for about 28 days. Uh, they'll return back to Earth, and then we sam uh, process our sample. So you can see while this sounds really easy, it really is not. And we have to go through a lot of rigorous testing and also regulatory approval. And for Australians to launch anything to the ISS, it actually has to get final approval from the Prime Minister himself uh, because it's representing Australia. So it's not something that I just thought up and then you know, it will happen. It actually has to go through a lot of process. So in conclusion, I hope tonight that I'm able to give you a glimpse of what is going to happen in the next couple of years in the space arena, especially in the space biology, space medicine, and space healthcare. And that the future for curing earthborne diseases might very well be found while conducting this type of research in space. So finally, like I said, you know, this type of project is not something that I can do by myself, but rather it's a collective work of a lot of talented people. Um, uh, so that's why I'd like to acknowledge and thank my past and current students for trusting me, having blind faith in me, and leading them into the unknown. And fortunately, we have something to show for it. Um, and also all the international partners that has worked with me um, to make this possible. And finally, I would like to end again with Isaac Newton's quote, no great discovery was ever made without a bold guess. Um, and I hope that continues to hold true for, um, for moving forward. Um, and I also would like everyone here tonight, um, if you would like to follow us in our journey into, the, into our space research, you can find us on Twitter um, or follow on us on our website, email us. Um, and when I say support, you know, it could be just even words of support. Um, that means a lot to us. Um, to have those words of encouragement. Um, we also have a Kickstarter if you're feeling, if you can support us financially, the students as well, um, that will also be great. Uh, so thank you very much everyone for listening and coming here tonight and I hope um, you've enjoyed and learned something about space tonight.